What's up, everybody? Oh my God, that's insane. Someone get this in security? Please, Robert Scoble's talking loudly. Hello. Hello. Thank you. I do appreciate that enthusiasm. I'm going to talk at you, uh, not necessarily with you, for a few minutes about this. Not my name <laughs> or title, but about how digital storytelling can adapt and change with a more real-time environment. Uh, let's first, very quick, for those who don't know where I'm coming from, uh, I have been in the future before. I hosted a TV show for Discovery Science Channel called Popular Science's Future Of. We examine the future of habitat, the future of sex, the future of pleasure, the future of combat. It was very troubling to me that the future of pleasure was a distinct episode from the future of sex, uh, but that is the future as it rolls out. I learned a couple of things about the future doing this show, principally that in the future, black people are required to wear wetsuits. So I've got mine. I am ready to roll. I served as director of digital for the finest uh, journalistic institution in the world, known as The Onion, America's finest news source. Thank you. And, uh, and I've moved on now to found a new organization called Cultivated Wit, which uses comedy uh, to engage in these rapid and confusing digital times. I also wrote this book. It's called How to Be Black. And there's a very simple marketing message behind it. Uh, if you don't buy it, you are a racist. It's not me talking. That's science talking. We've done the studies. It's just an absolute fact. It worked. Helped get the book to bestseller status. So guilt is an effective tactic, just something to keep in mind. So we are in an era of increasing speed, volume, and sources of information. We're overwhelmed with confusion and with data and with streams. And this lends itself, this creates an opportunity for new stories to be told. Stories like this one, one of my favorites from uh, the Onion catalog. <laughs> Obama's hillbilly half-brother threatening to derail campaign. Uh, that figure may look a little recognizable. That was me standing in as Cooter Obama. Uh, in my time at The Onion, I served many roles. I played President Obama. I played the mayor of Detroit. I played all three of the Supremes. It was quite an honor to be all the black people in The Onion photographs. Uh, or if you go around the world, you'll see these satirical stories built with digital tools, cheap distribution, network writing rooms. This is out of El Chaguire B. Polar in Venezuela. Essentially, this story says that this candidate, Capriles, has broken the record for cliche, undeliverable promises in one speech. At over 10,000 promises in 10 minutes, uh, he shattered the previous record held by current president, Hugo Chavez. Uh, or if you look to Nigeria, this is kind of their version of a satirical news outlet. Nigeria to have more pastors than congregation in 20 years. Again, the infrastructure for this sort of storytelling environment and platform doesn't cost very much. It's made possible truly by the internet. That's a basic version of the story. So as we think about real time and high speed and fast speeds, one of the things that comes obviously is just to react more quickly in our storytelling. When this real news event happened, the passing of Steve Jobs, the virtual version of the Onion Writers Room got to work and looked a bit like this. You're seeing something most people haven't. This is a behind the scenes of proposed stories that the Onion would run uh, in the moments after we discovered Steve Jobs had passed. I'll share a few of those with you. Uh, panicking Apple board of directors attempt to restart Steve Jobs. Uh, Apple shareholders, fuck, 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 fuck. iPhone touchscreen activated by streaming tier. And the story that actually ran was this one. Last American who knew what the fuck he was doing dies, which is a statement about much more than an iconic technology and business leader, but really about the great American experiment and where it stands. The other evolution that we're seeing in storytelling is just to do it while the story unfolds, to cover things live and with context. These are behind the scenes shots of the very anal retentive methods that we used at The Onion to live cover the State of the Union, the Oscars, and the Super Bowl. And the way this began 
Several years ago, I was watching the Oscars, and I saw Queen Latifah on the stage. And I said, oh, man, we have a, we have a story about Queen Latifah that would go perfectly at this moment. It says, King Latifah returns for Queen. And so I dug through the archives, I posted that to Twitter using the Oscars hashtag, and then as other celebrities presented themselves, went back into the archives, kept finding evergreen content that would match the moment, and pretty soon people said, oh my God, The Onion's live tweeting the Oscars, which was sort of true. We were live archive searching and reposting on the Oscars hashtag, but live tweeting is a much shorter way to examine that. So we evolved from that to preparing for such events, grab some archive content, write things conditionally just in case certain events happen, someone throws an interception, someone's injured on the sidelines, uh, and have a real-time writer's room develop for these common cultural moments, this virtual water cooler experience, which is so rare in a fragmented media market. I also do a bit of public service. Uh, there is uh, an atrocious literary series known as Twilight, it's done great damage uh, to the nation that I'm from, to, uh, to young ladies around the world, to families, and dare I say, to the world. And then this institution was ported to the screen in a film series. It's among the worst things to happen to humanity. There's like Twilight, slavery, uh, other genocides. And so, I mean, it, it, those things make the list. Twilight just happens to top it. And so what I like to do is use my powers for good. And on opening weekend, I will take my laptop or an iPad, sit in the back of the theater so the glowing screen doesn't disturb people, and I live hate tweet uh, the film, which is to say I live tweet the movie with a heart full of hate uh, and essentially describe what's going on. When you think about this, it's a very pro-stalker movie about a low self-esteem girl who gets kidnapped all the time despite the fact that her dad's a sheriff, uh, maybe the worst police officer in the land. Uh, and so I also would ask questions that other outlets maybe would be afraid to ask, like if Bella has sex with Jacob, is that bestiality? Uh, and if so, can she be prosecuted under Washington state law? So this has led to many people not seeing the movie, uh, for which I am proud. There is no such thing as a spoiler alert for this franchise. It's all spoiled by its existence. One other way to think about real-time storytelling is to fire on all angles at the same time. Here I'll present another example uh, from a fine journalistic institution. We launched a story as it was developing, one from our, our own imaginations, but one that was real to us nonetheless, and we started filling it out. We said, you know, there was witnesses reporting screams and gunfire at the U.S. Capitol, then quickly follow that up with 12 children held hostage by a group of armed congressmen with the hashtag, Congress hashtag, that binds the story, gives people a place of convergence. And then we got this amazing shot. Uh, we really put our photojournalist in harm's way to get the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, holding a gun to a clearly adorable and innocent little girl's head. Uh, and then we continue to roll out the story, the demands for money, the history of Eric Cantor and a gun shop, the reports from the scene, et cetera. And most troubling, we were able to get some shaky uh, but reliable video from inside the Capitol during this tense situation. Uh, we need audio for those who are work in my AV family, but you can kind of get a gist for what's going on here. Essentially what happened in that video is you hear a voice off camera say, uh, Boehner, this kid's got a phone, uh, and then a shot. And it's, uh, it's very troubling, especially for those of you who have kids, I probably should have warned you uh, about that. So we continue to roll out this story. President Obama's trying to play the hero, talking to John Boehner, saying, I know this Congress well, trust me, they will kill these kids. And uh, he is in a position to know, having dealt with this Congress, and rounding out the tale with this uh, essentially meta-commentary that the hostage negotiation talks have stalled in Congress. So here's what happened out of that as, as a reaction from actual media. Uh, we were under investigation by the Capitol Police. People were asking, was it too soon? Did satire go too far, et cetera, et cetera? And what really happened here was that first tweet caught a little people off guard. 
Some journalists retweeted it and uh, then got caught with egg on their face when they said, oh, wait, that's coming from the onion. And they said, oh, shouldn't they have added a satire hashtag to clarify that this wasn't real? And uh, I contend that that satire hashtag is implied uh, by the fact that the tweet came from an account called The Onion. And you've kind of failed basic journalism skills of checking your sources before broadcasting information. Uh, and so feeling terrible about themselves as journalists, they lashed out at us as satirists. Here's what our editor wrote in response to this incident. I was thinking we could say something about how irresponsible it is for the news media to report on something that the news media is reporting on irresponsibly. And that Twitter is ultimately to blame and should start censoring tweets. This just goes to show how dangerous free speech is when in the hands of reporters. A very uh, true and astute observation. Another opportunity that exists in this new world of possible stories is to adjust that story for each platform, not to merely copy and paste the text or even the concept, but really speak the language of the local entity. Uh, this is an example of a story, and I just want to give a heads up to my AV friends in the back if we can get the audio working on this, it will work much, much better. Uh, Foursquare is a fun platform uh, to play around with, not just to check in or share tips. A friend of mine and I, Jennifer Magnolfi, decided to run a mayoral campaign, uh, a legitimate mayoral campaign using Foursquare as the platform. I was the mayor of a venue. She challenged me. I was greatly offended. I'd been doing a great job as mayor. We experienced peace, uh, great middle class economic growth, delicious hamburgers. And so everything was going well until this challenge. So we set a term, we set rules of the road, you know, no fake check-ins. We built up campaign staffs. So we went there every day for a month in an attempt to race to the top of that mayoral chart. And then we took it to the physical world uh, when I held a rally for my Foursquare mayoral campaign on the streets of New York City across from the venue. Here is a short clip of that. So yeah, that, uh, that happened. And what we didn't capture in that footage, it was a moment right after, uh, not on video, but when you do a, any sort of political statement, you're often met with an equal and opposite reaction by those opposed uh, to your platform. And this was not staged, this was not coordinated in any way. Uh, these are coworkers, former coworkers of mine, who had just had enough uh, of my ego, essentially, and wanted to knock me down a notch, understandably. So we go into the restaurant right after this, and the story doesn't end. There's a man who's very upset. He has witnessed all of this. And he's frustrated and curious and confused as to why what he just saw happened. Uh, he, you're not really running for mayor. You didn't, you didn't cure AIDS. He says, who, who are you to have all these people rallying around you? You're getting paid by delicatessen? Are you getting paid by Foursquare? I was like, no, nah, man, it's just, it's just an art project. Like, settle down, it's gonna be okay. And he said, no, Foursquare owes you reparations for this. I was like, I don't, first of all, I don't think that's the word you mean. I don't think 
four square owes me reparations. And second of all, we can just do this now. We can create an opportunity for people to come together. We also have footage I won't go into, but I actually lost this race. I lost on a day that I had not checked in, decided to help my friend run his real political campaign. And as I was headed out to canvas the neighborhood in the Bronx in New York, I got the alert which says you've been ousted. Uh, and I made that, that famous call that any losing candidate makes, the concession call to my opponent, uh, reminding her that in politics, half the battle is showing up, but in Foursquare, 100% of the battle is showing up. Uh, and she showed up clearly a little bit better than I did. So we'll go past that. When the swine flu happened, uh, I was part of a ridiculous effort. I uh, created a satirical Twitter account uh, called The Swine Flu and wanted an opportunity to really just mess with people. There was a lot of legitimate information going on out there that wasn't my interest. And so I would find people who were uh, fearful of the swine flu and I'd follow them. So they get an email saying you're now being followed by the swine flu, uh, which really made me happy. Uh, we also, when we moved it to Facebook, uh, hosted face licking parties to encourage people to spread our message of doom and destruction. And that was the port. It wasn't just posting a bunch of status updates. How do you use the platform to make the story a richer experience? So we have the opportunity for new stories. We have the opportunity for new ways to engage by being a platform, for one, by letting others kind of participate and take part in a way. This is one of the most popular stories during uh, my time at the Onion. <laughs> Planned Parenthood opens $8 billion abortion plex. Planned Parenthood is the largest provider of women's health care in the United States. About a year ago, Congress was threatening to pull its funding because a very small percentage of its budget goes toward funding uh, Planned Parenthood activities like abortion. And so we did this story, and all the details of any satirical news event is located in Topeka, Kansas. These are some of the features, and $8 billion is a very large figure. Uh, last winter, a politician, a member of the House of Representatives, posted this story to his Facebook page and complained to his followers and constituents, see, this is what we're up against. Look at what these people plan to do. Uh, and he did that, A, because he is an idiot, and that happens. Many politicians are. In some cases, it's a prerequisite to achieve higher office. Uh, he also did it because, you know, his brain was predisposed to accepting seemingly informative bits of knowledge that aligned with his pre-existing views on the world, rather than triggering the common sense filter, which says this is impossible. Uh, so that happened. But the most interesting thing for me that happened out of this was on Yelp, where one of our readers, community members, created the abortion plex as a venue inside of Yelp. And they took the cues from the article, but went much further and provided an opportunity for other people to be a part of this to the tune of nearly 300 reviews of the abortion plex inside Yelp itself, a place that doesn't really exist engendered many real and in-depth Yelp reviews. This is one of the longer and more recent ones. I stopped by here to check it out because I got a gift card from my friend who told me that the abortion plex has the best mimosas and performs the best abortions. Let me tell you, I am a sucker for both. I've been places that have had just so-so mimosas, but good abortions and vice versa. They go on, there are people talking about how the salsa bar is to die for. Would have been five stars if it wasn't for the 18% gratuity they tacked on just because it was triplets. We drove to the abortion plex from Dallas, Texas. The Shell gasoline station next door gives 10 cent a gallon discount to out-of-state drivers. We'll definitely be back. And this one, simply too many stairs. <laughs> a very low review, one star review for the number of stairs at the non-existent abortion plex. That's engagement, right? Building a conversation into the platform is one way to do it. In my own book, Questions Were Baked In, I asked a panel of black experts, which is to say a panel of black people, questions like, when did you first realize you were black? How black are you? Have you ever wanted to not be black? Can you swim? 
because I wanted to get to the heart of blackness, if not the heart of darkness. And here's how some of that turned out. The audio again. So we took, we took that concept, we took a video for a book, which is weird already. We built the website on Tumblr, which is a conversation-enabled platform natively and from the start. And when the book rolled out, we asked these questions and more every day of Black History Month to engage the public in what identity meant for them, whether they were black or not. The other thing uh, that we did was be very provocative with the, the book's design. This is the cover, you know, it, it, it's a very controversial cover depending on who's holding it and where you're holding it. This book was being held by uh, a white man. His name is Neil Brennan. He's a co-creator of Chappelle's show. I gave him the book. He went into the New York City subway and was surrounded uh, by this cadre of black dudes whose facial expressions truly reflect uh, the range of reactions to the book itself. Right? The guy on the left is kind of befuddled. Uh, the guy holding the book is super engaged, like really learning some good stuff. The guy right to him is slightly offended. And then the man on the far right couldn't be bothered. He's an expert already, been black his whole life, wears a turtleneck, doesn't need any further tips on how to be black from the likes of me. Uh, then there was this photo, uh, th a different version of the book. We split the covers 50-50, white on black, black on white, to have fun with people. There's an advanced racial profiling algorithm which determines which version of the book you get. Uh, depending on what you need in your life. This was a woman in D.C. at a Starbucks who, so for all outside appearances, fell asleep holding the book. Uh, but what she's actually doing is learning by osmosis. It's a very new method of consuming media, saves a lot of time. People are very rushed in this real-time storytelling world. The last uh, you know, layer of engagement I want to, to get into is uh, an experiment in radical transparency. I wrote the book, big chunks of it, in public using the screen sharing technology from join.me. It was a suggestion from a friend of mine, and uh, people could see what I saw. It was a way of looking over your shoulder without having people physically breathing down your neck, spreading their germs, being very awkward. Uh, and I called it live writing. I thought, let's see if we can bring people in even earlier in the process. And here's what they said in the chat room that I looked at after. Uh, it gives me a connection with the author. How self-obsessed does one have to be to set something like this up? The answer is very. Uh, just a little I've read here makes me want to buy this book. Yes, when? Uh, it's interesting to see his writing flow. Lots of writers had never seen the writing process before. You see someone at a cafe typing, you don't see their screen. If you do, you're standing too close and probably violating a restraining order. Uh, I'm surprised to see Baratunde use semicolons. I don't know if I put off some kind of anti-semicolon vibe 
uh, or if that's just a weird form of punctuation, racism, but that was an interesting comment to me. And then this was the, this was the golden response. My girlfriend is Chinese, and I'm half Jamaican, half regular black. <laughs> I think our kids might end up Dominican <laughs> or something. What is regular black? And if that exists, is there diet black and black zero? Was there a failed 90s experiment in black clear? These are the questions that are raised by this comment. Your kids ending up Dominican, that to me is you know, obviously a skin tone uh, mixing observation, but I like the idea that they would come out speaking Spanish, loving baseball, eating mofongo and plantains, uh, or something. Maybe you just don't even have a child, you have a banana because it's, anything's possible. Anything is possible. Uh, lastly, I wanted to talk about new ways to share. So we've got new stories, new ways to engage. How do we propagate those? These are it's a really quick hit, but I, I want to give some attention to these products and these platforms and these services. Nodes, which lets you intelligently find expertise in your existing social networks. Plexus from Marshall Kirkpatrick, formerly Read Write Web, which lets you find experts and relevancy around the world using a very intelligent search. Attentively, which uses your email list and helps you write content that's relevant to the people already attached to you. And Skillshare, which lets anyone teach a class in the physical world. All new modes of reaching out, of connecting, of sharing in a relevant fashion, ideally, in my view, with new stories and new ways to engage in that. Stories are worlds that we build. They are more than just ideas. We can fill them in. We can round them out. We can create multiple access points into them from various platforms and think about it that way. Communities can inhabit and interact with them. It's much cheaper to do that in a digital and virtual space than in a physical sense. And we can engage in ways that go beyond pandering. Tell me what you think. And beyond, you know, short of full abdication, do my job for me. There's some space in the middle where real creativity and fun happen. Additionally, stories can increasingly happen anywhere. My final example comes from a very unlikely place. It comes from Google Voice. When you are sending a text message in Google Voice to the web interface, as you see on the screen, just above the box, 2.27. You know, I've been typing a message for a while here. I'm in the second message. It's carried over. There's 27 characters left. Watch what happens when it spills over into the third message. Google challenges me. Google disses me. Google says, are you kidding? Really? Maybe you sure you don't want to move to email for this length of message. That is a minor but important example of how you can embed comedy and narrative and perspective even in the code itself. And that, to me, is part of the future. It's democratic in the sense that it's beyond voting. It's democratic in the sense you have civic institutions and societies and engagement and voting and campaigning. All of those are part of what democracy means. Stories and engagement can mean a lot more than liking and retweeting and commenting. Also, uh, in the future, we're all Dominican or something. Thank you very, very much, LeWeb. Thank you, London and Lundress. See you at lunch.